The next presenter is my colleague, Guillermo Rosas, professor of political science at WashU in arts and sciences. His project is about the role of political ideology on COVID-19 mitigation in Latin America. This cross-country, cross-discipline collaboration involves colleagues from Brazil, Chile, Colombia, and Mexico, and form a number of WashU departments. There we go. Thank you, uh, Dean Hu. Thank you for that uh, kind introduction. And thank you to the McDonald Academy. Thank you uh, to all of you in the audience for uh, joining us uh, today. Good morning to all of you. Good afternoon to all of you. Good evening, uh, wherever you are. As uh, Dean Hu was saying, uh, our, our project, the, the grant that we uh, obtained from the McDonald Academy, is helping us uh, start a number of ideas, a number of papers around the topic of does politics make you sick, where we examine the, the impact or the influence of political ideology on COVID-19 mitigation across the Americas. Uh, as Dean Hu suggested, this is truly a multi-country international team uh, that has joined together researchers from Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Mexico. The main uh, investigators on our campus, uh, aside from myself, are Professor Rodrigo Reyes and Deborah Salvo in the Brown School. And elsewhere, we have support from the University Alberto Hurtado in Chile, Universidad de los Andes in Colombia, the Catholic University of Paraná in Brazil, and our partner institution, Tec de Monterrey. I would particularly like to recognize uh, my colleague, Andrea Ramirez Varela from the Universidad de los Andes. She's going to be joining us later today to, uh, to, in the Q&A session. And Fernando Lopez, who is in fact at the Universidad de Alberto Hurtado, but he's an alumnus of the McDonald Academy. So thank you to uh, all of my colleagues for, uh, for all their, their help throughout this process. They have been instrumental in helping us shepherd a rather complicated uh, multi-country survey through uh, the institutional review boards of a number of institutions, as you can see here. Let me uh, start by telling you what the background of this investigation is. If you recall, early on in the pandemic, we were quite aware that this was going to be a rather difficult public health and medical challenge. After all, the world was dealing with a new pathogen uh, in a completely globalized world with open borders where people could, in principle, travel freely. Beyond the public health challenge, however, it was also important to recognize that we were living in a very charged political environment, one of increasing polarization, particularly in the West. So the kind of images that you see here are ubiquitous. I'm sure that you are well aware of them. These ones in particular come from the United States, where uh, President Trump in particular, uh, his response to, to COVID-19 did plenty to model the message that was uh, in principle meant to come from, uh, from experts, from doctors, from public health specialists. So the main thrust of our project is to try to understand at the individual level how political attitudes broadly construed, I mean, we talked about ideology before, but in fact, we're, we're looking at political attitudes broadly construed, how they affect the attitudes, uh, the knowledge and the behavior that individuals have related to the COVID-19 um, pandemic. So there are obviously multiple avenues and multiple mechanisms through which uh, the political environment can affect the responses of individuals to COVID-19. Let me start by saying something about political attitudes. So you see here that we consider uh, things like the ideology of individuals, that is their self-placement on the left, right, or liberal conservative scale. Uh, more importantly, and this, this is uh, particularly uh, important in the case of Latin America, we also consider the strength of, uh, or rather the support for incumbent presidents, the support for incumbent government, uh, governments, as uh, something that might have an impact on the willingness of individuals to engage in a number of behaviors that are meant to be preventative of COVID, but also remedial. For example, we, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about this in a second. We're gonna consider vaccine acceptance, but also prevention behaviors like uh, uh, social distancing or engaging in practice of hygiene, wearing masks, washing hands, things of that sort. We, we have a, this is the main thrust of our research, but our, the surveys that we have put together actually contain a large number of questions 
regarding other important uh, considerations or important factors. For example, one uh, that we are particularly excited about has to do with policy approval. That is, what exactly it is that respondents think of the ways in which governments were attempting to tamper the spread of COVID-19. I mentioned before that we are interested in studying Latin America, and you would have gathered that anyway from the composition of our international team. But let me tell you a little bit more about uh, the, the remit of our, uh, of our study. We, are, uh, we launched basically surveys in four Latin American countries. You can see them here in the map, Mexico, Colombia, Chile, and Brazil. Why exactly these countries? Well, there are a number of reasons. First, uh, we are certainly considered the largest countries, uh, demographically speaking, in Latin America. So between these four, we are already covering upwards of 60% of the Latin American population. Second, these are usually characterized as middle income to high income countries, as you can see by the GDP per capita figures that appear here on the slide. So these are not countries that are lightweight in terms of their capacity to promote public health. And yet what we see is that there is very important variation in uh, the effect of COVID uh, across, across these countries. And of course, this is true elsewhere in the region. Uh, the final number that you see here is the number of COVID deaths up to uh, last week. And as you can see, particularly Brazil has been very severely affected by COVID. So, with support from the McDonnell um, Academy, what we have done is that we have uh, fielded one first survey. These data were conducted uh, in, the, in the Northern Hemisphere winter uh, about 10 months ago in January of 2021. And we plan to, uh, to have a, a second follow-up survey uh, a year after this one, so in January 2022. And uh, the samples that we obtained, this is of course an online sample. This is not always easy to do in Latin America, but we partnered with, a, with, a, with an organization that has capacity to uh, interview individuals from different national panels. As you can see, this is a, these are relatively large samples. We're talking about 8,000, uh, more than 8,000 individuals sampled in the first wave, and the same will be true during the second wave. And the samples broadly resemble the national characteristics of the populations of these four countries. We do have slight biases in that um, people that are more affluent and younger tend to be slightly overrepresented, but, uh, but not really by, by, a whole, by a whole much. I mentioned before that there were several reasons to concentrate on these countries. And a further one that was of most interest to us was that when we look at the modeling of public health messages in Western countries, particularly in democratic regimes in Western Europe, and the United States, what we see is that it has been mostly the action of far-right anti-establishment populist leaders uh, or, or political parties, whether in power or not, that seem to be uh, doing uh, the most damage. And so it's important that we try to disentangle what part of it comes from the particular ideological disposition of these politicians and parties, that is, whether they are coming from the left or from the right, and their particular attitudes Towards, uh, towards power, whether basically they are run-of-the-mill, regular politicians that we could characterize as institutionalists, or rather, whether they have jumped on this anti-establishment populist vein that runs around the world, and they are exploiting that in order to, to get power. So in Latin America, we see nice variation in that in these four countries, we have institutionalists, so the center-right governments of Presidents Duque and Piñera in Colombia and Chile, respectively, would be examples of that. And we have a couple of populists. Those would be the experiences of Bolsonaro in Brazil and President López Obrador, known by his acronym AMLO, in Mexico. And simultaneously, we have also some variation between left and right. Uh, AMLO's presidency is characterized as a center-right, center-left, excuse me, uh, presidency. The presidencies of Piñera and Duque are center-right. And finally, Bolsonaro is usually characterized as a far-right populist uh, leader in Brazil. So, of course, our expectation would be that mostly the populists, and particularly the far-right populists, would, uh, would, uh, would, would, uh, would be affecting the public health messaging of, uh, of, um, of Brazil, and that this presumably 
would uh, have an impact on um, a number of behaviors. The one that we're going to talk about now is vaccination, will, uh, willingness to be vaccinated, vac vaccination acceptance. So here I show you very quickly a descriptive graph of the responses to the question, uh, or rather uh, the responses to a prompt that asks uh, our survey participants whether they will take a vaccine as soon as a safe and effective one exists. And remember, this is a survey that happened in January of 2021. So this was before uh, the broad availability of vaccines in Latin America, the vaccine rollout has proceeded at different paces. The colors correspond to, uh, on the bottom part, the red colors to strongly disagreeing and, uh, and disagreeing, and the green colors to agreeing and strongly agreeing. And so one thing that we, we have seen in Latin America, surprisingly, is that there are very, very high rates of vaccine acceptance. Perhaps even more surprisingly, the highest rates of vaccine acceptance have occurred or occur in Brazil, uh, which is uh, particularly interesting. More, important, more importantly, and you don't see that in this particular graph, but we do know that the segment of individuals that responded to our survey that we would consider to be holdouts, not only people that are unwilling to accept the vaccine, but also unwilling to engage in preventative behaviors like social distancing and wearing masks, is actually very reduced. It's much lower than 10% across the board. So uh, if you look at some of the correlates of vaccine acceptance, for example, let me talk briefly about the case of Brazil, which you see on the left side of this graph. Uh, it is very obvious that those individuals in Brazil that are more educated, uh, we, we, we proxy that by the amount of time that they have spent in school, that are of higher socioeconomic status, are more willing to be vaccinated. This is also true of people that report having some uh, sort of comorbidity. Uh, however, after we parcel those effects out, it is also fairly obvious that support for the president, which uh, the indicator that we use for this particular attitude is whether the respondent voted for President Bolsonaro or not, is one of the strongest correlates of vaccine acceptance in Brazil. So when we put all of that together and we try to, uh, to uh, uh, figure out what we would expect supporters of Bolsonaro and those that oppose him to say with regards to the question about vaccination, whether they, people are willing to be vaccinated or not, we see, if you look at the leftmost panel for Brazil, we see that those that are against Bolsonaro, or rather those that voted against Bolsonaro during his uh, election uh, four years ago, are uh, actually much more likely to declare that they strongly agree to having a vaccination. Now, the news are not all that bad because even those that supported Bolsonaro, a populist right-wing president that has been uh, driving very, very confusing messages about COVID in Latin America, we see that even these individuals are relatively likely to say that they agree to be vaccinated. A couple other takeouts from this particular graph. Um, Chile seems to be the country where we have the lowest uh, vac uh, vaccination acceptance rate. Acceptance rate. In neither Chile, Colombia, nor Mexico do we see that support for incumbent presidents appears to have a statistically significant effect on the willingness of individuals, of respondents in our samples to become vaccinated. So let me finish, I think I have a minute or so, uh, by uh, relating you what the next steps are. Of course, the most obvious one is that we still need to finish our second survey. That's going to happen um, in, a, in, a, in a few months, in January 2022. We continue through the process of data cleaning and processing. We have a number of papers at various stages of, uh, of, um, of progress. Uh, the one that's more advanced, and in fact, we already have a, a couple of uh, 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 publications for, for public consumption, not, not necessarily uh, scientific publications, is our project with Fernando on COVID-19 and willingness to uh, support policies that allow individuals to withdraw savings from their pension funds. But on top of that, we also have projects, well, the one that I, I, I related to you today is on political attitudes and responses to COVID, uh, also on religiosity and attitudes towards COVID-19. And finally, we have uh, some experimental evidence on the effect of expertise in messaging about COVID-19. In closing, let me once again thank the Magnolia Academy for their support. 
thank my collaborators who are all uh, very, I think I speak for all of them when I say that we really are, are very uh, thankful to the McDonald Academy. And let me also say to the scholars in the room that if you are interested in joining us in uh, exploring some of these surveys and doing some of this research, we would love to hear from you. So here's my, my information. Please reach out to me in case you're interested. Thank you again. Thank you, Dinku.